Commissioner of Police, Mr. McDonald Jacob, and of course, Senior Superintendent Subero, and of course, we had, since the Defense Force was involved, we have with us the Operational Officer, Lieutenant Colonel Ashok Singh of the Trinidad and Tobago Regiment of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force. These personnel would have been out on the front line today, um, treating from the perspective of the laws and the Constitution and the business of national security with the issues as they arose today. So I would like immediately to give the floor to Mr. Jacob, who will tell us what transpired today in the city of Port of Spain. Thank you very kindly. Yeah. Good afternoon to all. Good afternoon to all, all the viewers, media. Thank you very much, Minister of National Security, Mr. Fitzgerald Hines. Again, we had a situation in Port of Spain this morning that started around 11 a.m., where persons from the Beatum, Silats, and areas in Laventil decided to block the roadway, the highway, bus route, and about four other locations like Duncan Street, Nelson Street. The police were in fact paying some measure of surveillance to the area with an expectation that there may be some disruption as a result of the recent police shootings, killings that took place over the weekend. However, the protest in itself was properly organized and the blockage took place simultaneously. The officers on the ground got assistance, again from the interagency task force, headed by Senior Superintendent Sibero, from the Garden Emergency Branch, headed by Senior Superintendent Eli. And we also engage our task force from three other divisions, at least Port of Spain Division, Northeastern Division, and the Northern Division, who came and gave support. The Defense Force personnel who normally work with the ITF and work with the police in the Port of Spain Division were part of it, but we got additional support through the Lieutenant from additional Defense Force personnel. Within two hours, we were able to clear the roadway with the support again of the Port of Spain Corporation, Regional Corporation, and the engineering core of the defense force, and we were able to clear the debris and cause the highway, both the east and westbound, to be cleared, and also the bus route, Duncan Street, Nelson Street, and the little pockets that we had happening on the Lady Young Road. You know, we wish to, again, thank our officers, because on this occasion, we had no untoward situations, even though six persons were arrested and two additional were arrested in the Lady Young area. But we had no untoward incidents. And we also want to thank, even though some persons were involved in the protests and the police came, a lot of them abide by the police direction and instructions so we were able to quell everything very quickly. So I'd like to thank the officers for their professionalism in how they handled the situation and we want to give the public the assurance that right now all the roadways are, are clear 
and the police, together with the defense force, remain steadfast and will be on the various corners, streets, and byways to ensure that this incident doesn't reoccur. In order to deal with it, myself and, and Lieutenant Colonel Singh, together with Senior Superintendent Sibir, we visit some of the families who were affected as a result of the shooting on the Beatum just about an hour and a half ago and interacted with them to give them the assurance that the police stand for the rule of law and the matter is under investigation by the senior superintendent, Mr. Brandon John. The officers involved were in fact placed on this duty as we go about this investigation. At some stage, as the investigation go along, the Professional Standards Bureau may be required to join in, in the investigation. And as you are all aware, that the Police Complaints Authority has that overarching responsibility in spite of the police investigation to do an investigation. And that is being conducted and being active at this point in time. So again, the residents who were not involved in the process, we like to thank, thank them, you know, because it could have been worse. And the persons who were involved and abided by the police instructions and directions, we also appreciate that. And then the officers who operated in a professional manner, you know, we want them to continue in this way, you know, as we go forward. So we again want to give you the assurance that everything has been quelled and through our hearts and minds team, right through our community policing section and the hearts and minds teams, we are doing the other form of work with the residents and we are actually supporting them to take them to the forensic science center and to get everything organized in relation to the deceased uh, persons. So again, thank you very much as we go forward and deal with this situation in the Port of Spain area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner, members of the media. So you have the key people with us here today. If you have any questions, they stand ready to respond to them. Hi, good morning, Jassy Gonz good, good evening, sorry, Jassy Gonzalez, Trinidad Express. Um, Mr. Commissioner, or Mr. Hines, uh, is there any body cam footage, any sort of footage at all that backs up what the police are saying about this incident on Saturday morning at 3.20 a.m.? Is there anything at all? Right. Well, I will answer like this. There is, in fact, footage that was captured by our main operational center and is now there, which is evidenced for the investigator. In fact, when these incidents are happening, in some instances, it is live captured by our operational center where the CCTV grid exists. So there is, in fact, footage which was evidenced and provided to the investigator. In a bit to quell the opposing voices of what happened on Saturday. Is there any plans to release that footage to enter the public domain? Well, as I said, the matter is actively under investigation. And again, you will recognize that in doing investigations, we don't want to do anything at all that will prejudice the investigation. Thus is not the practice when these are investigations are going on because that footage is in relation to the matters, if matters reach before the court or to be provided to ex exonerate persons who may be involved. So at some stage, consideration will be given, but in the early stage of the investigation, it is necessary that the investigators right, deal with it in a professional manner.
Yeah. Um, fairly hypothetical, but still. Now, we had the PC, uh, um, Gil Gilks, I believe his name was. Um, there was a whole thing surrounding that. Uh, the, the police had went to try to apprehend somebody, then he got shot, and now that was, well, that's within memory, uh, a month or two. And now today, protests. And my underlining question is um, police confidence, or the, the public conception of the police. Um, are, are you both satisfied with it? And Because I'm sure that the people today were trying to get some sort of message across or make their voices heard. And why? Because maybe they didn't have confidence in the normal channels. I don't know. But um, I, I just want to get a general gauge, gauge of what, how do you feel police confidence level is now. The, the, the public, and what could be done, for example, my colleague here mentioned body cams. Are, are there technical things that could be done? Are there training things? I think the former commissioner had said that the police train with their weapons one occasion in a whole year, and I don't think that could ever be sufficient. That, that, that's what I believe the figure it was. So, so I'm throwing that out as a general question to prevent future reoccurrences, and let's get back to you know, something a good situation. Well, some of the information, especially what you said at the end, is in fact a false because we have our officers who are trained on a regular basis, especially the frontline officers, in something that we call survival training, you know, and it is done at the Garden Emergency Branch and something at the Police Academy. So once persons are going in this front line, right, um, sections to work, they go about doing training on a regular basis to ensure that they can, in fact, deal with situations. Also, when the police service acquire new type of firearms, the officers are also trained, right, with those uh, firearms. The first part of your question, you know, when these things happen, there is pain throughout, pain in the family of the police service. Some of the officers who are involved, or, you know, go through that traumatic situation. We need to get our counselors and our social workers to play a significant part. And also, there is pain in the families and also in the communities. The police service are never happy at all or appreciate when these things occur. And that is the reason why, as you mentioned, training is so important in managing these situations. And that is the reason why our police academy is mandated to have that ongoing training constantly for our officers. You know, um, but you have the other side that is necessary because the police officers are out there and at times their life might be at risk, you know, and they need to operate, as I said, in a professional manner. So give and take, we'll have these situations, but training, as I said, and constant training, like what happened, tend to happen in the defense force also, right, is totally um, necessary. But the police service feel the pain, the administration, of the police service, I, as the acting commissioner, feel the pain. You know, you will have sleepless nights when these things happen because we need to come and deal with the population. We are here to serve the population. We are not to oppose the population. You know, look at the relationship that we have with the persons in the Beatum. We have police youth clubs. We have the Hearts and Minds program. We have the new steel orchestra that was established there. And we are doing work with that community constantly not just in Beatum, but in Laventille, in Nelson Street. We are within the communities, and whenever other government departments need to go into the communities, they use the police as the, as the gatekeepers. So we don't want anything to happen to really and truly to cut that relationship that we have with these communities. from Guardian Media Limited. Uh, 
uh, Commissioner, I just want to circle back to something you would have said in your opening statements. You said that the communities were under surveillance because you all were anticipating something of this nature to occur. But yet you said you only met with the family of those who would have been shot by police an hour ago. Is it a case that, we, that the police underestimated what was coming, uh, 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 which is why I would explain why it is that they weren't met with earlier? No, well, I said I met with them together with Mr. Singh about an hour ago. But our officers on the ground, yes. Senior Superintendent Sibero and his team from the Hearts and Minds, immediately when the incident occurred, our community officers and our Hearts and Minds officers visited the home and they even assisted them in reaching to the Forensic Science Center this morning. Mr. The, the senior superintendent is there. I don't know, Mr. Sibero, you will want to, to explain to them the process. Thanks. Any further questions? Yeah, um, Commissioner, again, you would have stated, uh, I believe it was earlier today, that or, or suggested that these persons might have been riled up to carry out the action that they might have, that would have transpired today. You care to elaborate a little bit more on that? What sort of riling up took place? Was it a political interference or anything like that? Well, I cannot say. All we have is some information of persons who give who encourage, who incite, you know, a, right, and organized. <coughs> and if we can get such information, you know, with persons who do that, you know, we will look at it from, from the, the, the criminal perspective, you know. But we have information of persons who, in fact, because Senior Superintendent Sibero and his team did a lot of work over the weekend to ensure that things wouldn't reach the stage that it reached. So, in fact, from the information we had, we handled it in a particular manner, and uh, it reached the stage that it reached. Definitely, there would have been protests over the weekend if Senior Superintendent Sibero and the persons from the Hearts and Mind team did not do the work that they did within the community over the weekend. Okay, and one of my final questions here, I just want to circle back to something my colleague would have raised there about public trust in the police. Last week alone, we had two reports coming out of the PCA that seems to, but it doesn't even seem it, the PCA definitely said that uh, officers mis misled you and there was an attempt to cover up the incident with uh, PC Gilks. Gilks, Gilks. Um, and then we also had the one coming out of last year's incident of what we saw today, uh, where Miss Greaves was killed by police. So is it of the National Security Ministry and even within the police that the longer that this uh, charges or anything take to be placed against the officers that might have been involved that it could further fuel mistrust in the establishment? Mm -hmm. Well, in answering your question, the last statement that was made, I'm answering it not agreeing or confirming what you are actually saying that the police shot Ms. Griggs. Okay? The PCA, in their initial investigation, they came to some measure of, of conclusion that they believe it could, right? Um, but that is in the early stages. That matter is still under investigation. Whatever the PCA have, they will pass it on to the police and, and the DPP. Those statements need to be evident. And when I'm saying it, I'm talking about the other matter immediately in relation to how the PCA will do it and what is required for the police to do. So I cannot come to any conclusion here until the investigation is completed by the police and they are guided and advised by the DPP. Okay, and my last, last question. Um, I, 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 no, I don't want it to seem that I'm taking away from what would have sparked or catalyze these demonstrations that we would have had today. But on the other side of that, we have probably tens of thousands of people who work in the nation's capital on a daily basis. People have to come in for business and that sort of thing. So uh, what assurances or what is going to be done to avoid similar instances like this happening again? And what would your advice be to people who are in the city when something like this occurs? Do they 
stay in the city and wait for it to, to, to die down, or do they try and immediately leave? What is your advice? Well, well, I believe that the the workers from over the period have developed a certain measure of confidence because we had an incident today, and as I said, within two hours' time, we were able to quell things, clear the streets, and persons now are going home safely. You know, so that is important. And what I will advise persons, when these incidents happen, I cannot give the assurance at all that persons will not decide at any time to protest or to block our road. You know, we continue to develop relationships with the community to ensure that those things don't happen. But I cannot give the assurance. But what I can say that any time it happens, you can listen. We will, the police, and through the Ministry of National Security also, will do releases to guide persons in relation to what sort of action they should take when these situations occur. So again, we want to give them the assurance. And today's example is a clear example of how things can be handled in a professional manner to ensure that persons can be safe. Yes, definitely, and that is the reason why I did several, um, we did a re release at a particular time, and I engaged the media, right, all around um, 1, 1, 30, I engaged in the media on two occasions, guiding them accordingly, and then our corporate communication did a release to, to also to inform persons exactly what is happening. Your question with trust and confidence, we are concerned about it because depending on how things are sold, whether or not in the general media or the social media or what happens, it tends to interfere in the situation itself, you know, interfere with the trust and confidence. But we are depending on the outcome of our investigations and the professionalism of our officers to do what is required to be done. And since we know the majority of the nation deals with the whole aspect of the rule of law, you know, we will abide by that as the investigations are completed. Jovan Ravello from TTT. I just had a couple questions for you. Given the frequency of these types of incidents where protests and um, similar actions shut down the city, is there a coordinated plan among the agencies to deal with these things? There is, in fact, a coordinated plan. And as you're seeing, as soon as the incident happened, the Lieutenant Colonel Singh was with me in, the, in our operational center and there were, in fact, other persons in our, uh, in a, from the intelligence side of it in another operational center where we were lazing, you know, and coordinating things. So there is a coordinated approach, and that is the reason why we were able to be so successful within a two-hour period to quell the situation and deal with it because it is coordinated even with the ODPM, you know. We use that platform to assist us in getting things done. Okay, and um, given the, again, the frequency of incidents between the police and the public, is there a review of the use of force policy um, currently in, in the works at the police? Well I, well, I think a lot of review have to be done, both in the police and some of our persons who have, are operating within our communities, some of the young persons, there are a lot of work need to be done. The police use of force policy, yes, we are reviewing it, and we are actually updating it to assist our officers so that they will have that high level of confidence when they are dealing with things out there. And there is there are training and retraining taking place, you know, as we, as we go forward. So it is totally necessary that we deal with the use of force in a particular way. One of the issues that we are having, the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, have now introduced a new patrol initiative where we do patrols through patrol grids and we form cordons. So when things happen, our time in responding have, has improved tremendously. And the fallout of that, in some instances, you will have uh, in more interaction with persons who are offenders who may decide to be involved in illicit and criminal activities. 
but it is to the benefit of the law-abiding citizens of the country that we develop such patrol policy and a grid in order to make Trinidad and Tobago safe. Um, one, one question, just against us, Trinidad Express. Was this grid used on Saturday morning? Yes, exactly. The grid, the patrol grid was in fact used. It has been used on our highways and byways within the last two months because you will see several interceptions that we had uh, with the recovery of several firearms and drugs in the manner in how we are doing things in a, in a sort of um, systematic way, which we use our operational centers as the epicenter to guide our operations with our patrols. As you are aware, recently we received up to this point 67 new vehicles, and that is used as a part of our patrol policy Right, where each division got additional vehicles, including the highway patrol, and there are some other vehicles that we'll be getting. And recently, I launched the whole aspect of the motorcyclists, where 41 motorcyclists were trained through survival training, and they are now provided to do patrols, not just on the highways and byways, but within communities. So all of that form part of our patrol grid as we go forward to make Trinidad and Tobago safe, and we are looking forward for that to build the trust and confidence of the police as the residents see more patrols and feel safer as we go forward. Okay, Rashad Khan here again from Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so we've kind of spoken about what happened. Now let's talk a little bit about what is to come going forward. Are you aware of any uh, of these actions still ongoing right now, protest action? and? What can the public expect to see from this joint coordinated effort from national security later into this evening, into tomorrow, for the rest of the week, that sort of thing? Well, I, I, short answer, we are sustaining our presence, active presence on the roadway until such time. We'll just be continuing. Yeah, if anybody wanted to comment on the figures, um, the figures of being 18 deaths, I believe, in 36 hours, um, if people are, you know, a little disturbed about that and hope for betterment and so forth between the two in the middle, please, your comments on those numbers, because it seems rather high when you look at because some of them were mass shootings for getting shot in one bunch in one go up in um santa cruz tree and independent square so it's quite a lot these several mass shootings apart and then two uh, so any comments if, if that number yeah, is right yeah yeah i think i i can say as a member of parliament and citizen of trinidad and tobago and of course as minister of national security that what you have just described is a function of the high and increasing levels of violence that subsists in this little and beautiful society. It is quite clear from the evidence you have just advanced that this place is becoming increasingly violent. Um, it also is a function of the extent and the ease to which people have access to lethal barreled weapons, deadly weapons called guns, firearms. And both those issues are of some concern to us as a government and to all of us as citizens of the Republic. In the first instance, the government continues to provide opportunities for the people of Trinidad and Tobago as best as she can for many, many decades, in fact, since our independence. We focus particularly on the young people who are the future. We established a standalone Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, which I had the honor to establish on behalf of the government, and it is now managed by one of my cabinet colleagues. 
That ministry takes into account young persons between the ages of 10 and 35 years. And you would have seen as members of the media, since its establishment, an outpouring, an outflowing of programs, some already existing and refurbished and some brand new ones, all with an intention of giving more and more youth of Trinidad and Tobago positive pathways, positive alternatives to the blandishments and the temptations of those who might want to encourage them to more negative pursuits. In addition to that, through the Ministry of Education, Roughly seven billion a year, the highest in the national budget, is allocated to maintain the seamless education platform that we have on offer for the young people of Trinidad and Tobago. And you will know better than most as members of the media that many, many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of our young people have adopted and accepted that over many decades and have done as well as you have and all others very, very well. It's expensive, it requires management, it has its challenges. We have done the business. So you have a primary school, you have the early childhood seamlessly into the primary school, secondary school, tertiary level education with support from GATE and all the other supporting elements opportunities for the young people. And the fact is, most have made tremendously good opportunity of it. In addition to that, through the Ministry of Sport and Culture, Community Development, through the Ministry of Social Development, through the Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Fisheries, through the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service again, even through the Ministry of National Security. We have a host of programs and opportunities for young people to gain tech voc training, technical vocational training, various institutions. Sport, we have the elite sport program, which likes of, the likes of Keyshawn Walcott and others have benefited from. We have in social development, startup funds, entrepreneurial training, technical support for those who want to begin small businesses and start them up. And this is across the agenda, even inside of the prisons. For those who would have gone of scans, there are training programs aplenty inside of the prisons in the context of rehabilitation and restoration. In other words, and in short, there are tremendous opportunities for the development and for the benefit of the young people of Trinidad and Tobago. In addition to all of that, there are enough pathways, institutions, arrangements for persons, whether acting as individuals, if you are affected or affronted by the defense force, by the police, by any agent or agency of the state through the courts by way of judicial review and by way of direct action in the courts where disputes can be resolved, where redress could be sought against law enforcement, the defense force, the nursing profession, doctors who may have acted negligently. There are systems through the courts supported by legal aid to allow persons an opportunity at an individual level to seek redress if they are offended. Insofar as the communities are concerned, there are enough opportunities. The, the police will have town meetings. The police have established mediation centers. And all of that kind of thing, allowing opportunities for the resolution of disputes, allowing opportunities for the re resolution of grudges and disgruntlement, allowing opportunities for the resolution of conflict. And I am submitting, in my view, there is no need to resolve our grouses and our conflicts with raw violence, shooting up a car with four people, capturing a woman and a husband, killing them, burning them, 
there is enough opportunity in this civilized domain to resolve differences without having to resort to violence or even street protests. Though our constitution and the law provide for that in a democratic society and that is good and healthy, in some cases it goes beyond mere right to protest. Persons seek to block the roadways, burn things on the roadway to do damage to the road surface, disrupt the free flow of traffic, affecting people who are going about their lawful business, who have no direct concern, perhaps, with the issue at hand. And therefore, it is incumbent on the police and law enforcement and the society. You expect the police, expect law enforcement, to intervene to make your path safe and secure as was done today. And for those who cross the line in terms of the right to protest, peaceful demonstration and protest, as the democracy accords, if they cross the line and commit criminal offenses, as in the case of the eight or so that Mr. Jacobs, Mr. Jacob alluded to a while ago, then of course, the law takes care of that. And for me, it is quite sad to see that because knowing that there are other pathways to resolve issues that you would now go and find yourself on the wrong side of the law is making a, good, a, a bad situation worse. So if I may be permitted, from the time I became a member of parliament, a long time ago, I always visioned and dreamed, and this is why I encouraged the police to establish, to continue to maintain the youth clubs. The prison service have youth clubs. The fire service have youth clubs. The defense force has a number of specialized youth programs, CCC, MILAT, Civilian Conversation, Conservation Corps, and those kinds of CCCS, MILAT, MIPAT, and those others. To, to, you know, I encourage them to carry on with these programs so that they can bring the discipline of these organizations and share them with the young people and so on. So for my part in this contemplation that I had from the time I became a member of parliament is to see our communities living and operating in peace and in calm and with dignity and the police are there to protect those very communities from those among them in the community who are very capable of and have demonstrated capacity for doing even the peaceful members of the society all manners of wrongdoing. So it is to the police, it is to law enforcement that we look as a society to protect us. Granted, over the decades of our life as a nation, there are many occasions, too many in my view, when members of law enforcement, members of the teaching service, I recall something that happened in a school with children. So it's across the board. There are too many occasions when agents or agencies of the state act outside of the ethos, outside of the law, outside of the constitution, but thankfully, the law and the constitution has processes to bring redress to that. But I would really like to see our society live in peace and the police officers to maintain that peace and to act firmly when those who do threaten peace so do to the detriment of the people. Because as Minister of National Security, I received diverse amounts of complaints letters, emails about things people are suffering out there at the hands of criminals. And it is to the police I must turn on their behalf. It is to the police their turn. Sometimes they come directly to me. I have to let them know I ain't no police, but the commissioner of police is there, senior superintendents and other officers are there, and I directly refer them to them. And in many cases, we get wonderful resolution. Sadly, 
Violence seems to be the order of the day, and we will continue. Hence the reason why the Prime Minister said on his departure to that heads of government platform in Suriname that he considered in his intellect that the time is probably here when we as a society will have to begin to consider, as other countries have done, the question of violence and the extent of it and crime as a public health issue to be treated with from those perspectives. I went to the parliament today and had to answer a very banal question about what action we would have taken to develop that policy and I had to tell the person who asked the question that there was no policy announced. The Prime Minister merely stated for our contemplation that there must come a time perhaps when we will have to start considering this. And it is not a declaration that it is, but it is a matter for contemplation as exists in other countries. I read recently that in the United States, gun violence is now seen as a public health issue with all these murders taking place. In fact, up to today, I think somebody went into some place and shoot up some place and that sort of thing, much as drugs and its use and abuse to the detriment of so many of our children and so many of our people. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Except for me to say thank you all members of the media for coming and I take the opportunity to thank the Commissioner, to thank the Chief of Defense Staff and his representative Lieutenant Colonel Ashok Singh because they were out there walking, walking lockstep with the police today to bring security and safety for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And I would like to thank Senior Superintendent Subero for coming to interface with you on behalf of their organizations and I on behalf of the Ministry of National Security, which is happy to know that there is peace and safety and security in the land for all those who work and live here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Every day, we aspire to be better at what we do. Deliver more news more often to more people. We are your news team, reporting on the people, events, and issues that affect your life. TTT News, first at 6.30 p.m. TTT News, committed, accurate, relevant. TTT News, nightly at 6.30.